So uh, our first uh, speaker is our keynote lecturer, uh, Kenneth Harris, who's going to be uh, talking to us about high dimensional geometry of the cortical population code as revealed by one with lots of zeros, cell recordings. <laughs> Thanks, um, Simon, and uh, thanks for the organizers for uh, inviting me here. My, my, my second time in Montreal, but the only time it was safe to go outside, um, at, you know, without 20 layers of clothing. Um, so, right, so what I'd like to tell you about um, is some work we've done in recording what now seems like quite a large number of neurons simultaneously, although I've got to say I remember when 100 neurons seemed like a lot. So this will probably be small potatoes in, in 10 years. Uh, but the difference this time is that it seems that we've now reached the point where if we were even to record even more neurons, the fundamental finding wouldn't change because we've hit some sort of an asymptote. And, and I'll get to what I mean by that uh, in, in detail later. Okay, so this is uh, work done uh, by Marius Pachatariu and Carson Stringer, uh, who now have their own group at Genelia, uh, done in the lab that Matteo Carandini and I uh, uh, run at UCL, uh, University College London, and it's just come out on a, on a reprint uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, okay, so when you think of what say that the sensory systems do in the brain, um, the, the, there's an idea that has been around a very long time in neuroscience and is also seen in a lot of machine learning algorithms that you take a, 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 an input coded by a small number of, of input fibers, say the, the retinal uh, uh, ganglion cell axons to the, to the brain, uh, and, it's, and it's projected into a very high dimensional space. You have a large number of processing neurons, say the, um, the, 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 the cells of the, the visual cortex, uh, and then this information is harvested back down to a small number of output neurons. You see this uh, uh, pattern all over the place in the, in the cerebellum. These would be the granule cells. These would be the Purkinje cells. In the cortex, these would be the, the IT uh, neurons, and these would be the PT neurons, a small number of cells that project the output uh, out. So the idea is that, that you take an input and you make a high dimensional representation of it. So what properties might you want that representation or the, the neural code uh, to have? And again, the, the ideas on this go, go way, way back uh, in history. Um, so one of the first properties you might want of a neural code, by which I should say I just mean the correlation between the stimulus and the firing pattern, one of the first properties you might want is orthogonality. So what does that mean? The idea is, if you have a, a, an, an image that you see uh, with your eye, uh, it causes a particular firing pattern in the visual cortex. If you have a different image, it causes a different firing pattern uh, in, the, in the visual cortex. And downstream from this, there are neurons that, you know, maybe in a structure like the superior colliculus that is, is doing uh, controlling behaviors, there are neurons with weights to these visual cortical cells, uh, such that uh, if um, this picture, uh, uh, this image of a tree comes into the eye, you will you'll make the behavior to climb it, say, whereas if the, the image of a fish comes in, you'll make the behavior to uh, feed your fish. Uh, and the point of orthogonality is that if these populations are distinct, uh, if they, they don't overlap, then you can learn these output weights in one trial. Simple Hebbian learning, uh, if these uh, uh, orange neurons are active at the same time a training signal comes to this one, in one trial, at least in principle, these weights could be learned and they won't interfere with the weights to this other one. So orthogonality is a great property for neural codes to have in principle because it enables rapid learning and also efficient coding. Um, and the reason it's called orthogonality is because you can think of these firing patterns uh, of n neurons as defining a vector in an n-dimensional vector space. Orthogonality means that the dot product of those vectors is close to zero. So mathematically, that's orthogonal. Uh, on the other hand, that can't be the whole story. Because if every single pattern was orthogonal to every other single pattern, then even the slightest change in this input would lead to a completely different representation. You'd have no generalization. So you also want a property that when a similar uh, 
stimulus comes on, by which I mean behaviorally similar, it drives the same behavior, not that it's physically similar, it should cause a similar pattern, they should overlap. So not everything is orthogonal, some patterns need to be related, and this uh, leads to a concept of smoothness of the neural code. The, the code has to vary smoothly with the required behavior, uh, and, and these patterns then won't be orthogonal. So putting these two together, you get what could be called a, a manifold hypothesis. So the idea is that there are n neurons, they define this n-dimensional vector space, but not every possible combination of those n could happen, only a subset. And a manifold is a subset that has a smooth structure. So in other words, the representation, the firing pattern caused by this image, and this image might be very different, uh, but the behaviorally similar images will have representations that are not too far from the original ones. And that means you need to, the, the, the neural code needs to lie on this, this surface that has this smoothness property that if you have uh, this uh, point is in, in, the, in the, the set of possible firing patterns, then it needs to have neighbors there as well. They can't all be isolated atomic points all over the place. And, and this idea that it's a manifold is pretty much everyone takes it for granted. It's an assumption. It actually doesn't have to be true, and we'll see later an alternative uh, that, that, that could have been the case. Um, question? Would you like to have questions in the middle, or would you prefer to just go? I'd, I'd prefer to just, well, it's up to him, okay. but. No, um, no, I think All right, okay, yeah, clarifications, yeah. Um, okay, so the third property you might want in a, in a neural code is, is redundancy. So this is a very different idea, and, and there's a great paper way back by John von Neumann, one of the inventors of this type of computer, but, and the, the, one of the fascinating things about this is that they refer to logic gates, like AND gates and NOT gates, as neurons uh, back in 1952. Uh, the other, um, the other point, though, is he makes a point that if your neurons uh, or logic gates are unreliable components and you want to make a reliable organism, as he called it, out of them, you need a lot of them doing the same thing. So, in other words, there would be teams of neurons that all, that it's, it's one for all. If one of them is going to respond to this stimulus, they're all going to, or at least they're all going to try to. And then between them, after you take into account the failures, there will be enough, enough going on. And this idea received experimental support not very long after with the discovery of the cortical column, as it at least appeared then. Uh, now more questions about whether this is actually true. But as it appeared then, nearby neurons always encode the same thing. So you have this kind of redundancy. Okay, and there's a tension, though, between redundancy and orthogonality. If you have redundancy, you have less neurons to play with, which means you can code less neurons in a fully orthogonal way. So the question of what the brain actually does is an experimental question that needs experimental data to answer. So, and we're going to try and answer it here, and, and, and to do it, we're going to use a concept of dimensionality. So the idea is orthogonal representations are high dimensional, redundant representations are low dimensional. Dimensionality has many different definitions. We're going to do three in this slide. A fourth one is going to come up later. But let's just work with these three for now. So imagine you had just three neurons, then that defines a three-dimensional space of possible firing patterns. But also imagine that the actual firing patterns that actually could happen in reality were these, these circles here. Now, these uh, lie on a plane of dimension two, so we say the planar dimension of this code is 2. But they also line on a, lie on a curve, a curved line of dimension 1. It's not a straight line, it's a curved line. The planar dimension is still 2. But because the dimension of this line, this curved line is 1, we say the intrinsic dimension, or the, or the nonlinear dimension, is 1. So we've got these three different definitions of dimension. This is the number of neurons. This is the size of the plane it can fit on. And this is the, the nonlinear dimension of the, of the manifold uh, itself. And they need to be in this order. This needs to be bigger than this, which needs to be at least as big as this. Um, OK, so the question, is cortical activity really high dimensional? It's an experimental question. From the orthogonality theory, it ought to be. It's an experimental question. The data so far seem to say no. Uh, in this review by Gao and Ganguly, 
they collected together a whole lot of data from many different experiments uh, that had done dimensionality reduction, and they find that nearly all of them can, uh, can represent the neurons in a low dimensional space. On the other hand, um, as pointed out by these very same authors uh, in this same paper, there's no way these experiments could have given a different result. If you have a small number of stimuli or a, a, an experiment of limited complexity, you have to get a low dimensional answer. For example, if you only show three stimuli, then those th the, the responses to those three stimuli have to lie on a two dimensional plane. Endpoints always lie on an n minus one dimensional plane. So these experiments don't really tell us whether the neural code can be high dimensional when you have a high dimensional input. So our strategy was a two pronged strategy. First, we're going to present lots of sensory stimuli so we don't have that problem. And in particular, we record responses to thousands of natural images, and each one is presented twice for a technical reason because we need to do an analysis based on cross-validation. Um, and second, we're going to record lots of neurons. And we do that using uh, actually a conventional uh, two-photon microscope called the, the B-scope. You can, you can buy it. They'll come and set it up for you. It's not cheap, uh, but uh, it, the, it, it works. Uh, and the, the key trick is to use GCAMP6 slow which has a slow time course, the, the fluorescence hangs around for about a second. This allows us to image 11 planes um, at a slow scan rate of 2.5 hertz. So um, one uh, frame, uh, 2.5 frames a second, uh, which means that we'll see, still see all the spikes because the GCAM6 slow fluorescence lasts that long. And we're recording in, in the primary visual cortex of passive awake mice. Um, here's an example of some of the data. These neurons are flashing away uh, as they do. Uh, uh, and uh, there's uh, 11 planes. This one here is the flyback plane, so don't count this. But there's 11 different planes that image down to about layer 4 of visual cortex. And when you add it all up, you get 10,000 neurons. The difficult part is not the experiment, it's the informatics. And uh, Marius uh, developed this uh, quite amazing suite of software uh, called Sweet2P. Um, uh, and since this is an informatics conference, I will just talk about it quickly. Um, there's multiple steps in the pipeline. Image registration, uh, detecting the ROIs. Uh, there's a small step of manual curation, uh, which isn't completely avoidable. Basically, the ROIs that come out, uh, many of them are cells, some of them are dendrites, some of them are just errors. Um, so there's a step of manual curation that the operator has to go over uh, this and do it. Uh, but then there's a learning algorithm that after you've done enough manual curation, it learns what you're going to say, anticipates it, and by the time you get to the stage that it's predicting everything you're going to do, you stop bothering with the manual curation. And then the final part is spike deconvolution to find the times of the spikes. So here you see some fluorescence traces. These are the inferred spike times. They may not be 100% accurate. doesn't really matter. Um, the code is written in MATLAB, uh, and it's uh, available uh, at... Um, this uh, GitHub page, and there's a preprint about it as well. Um, okay, this is an example of some of the uh, cells recorded in one experiment uh, on these 11 planes. They're pseudo-colored by cell identity, uh, and, and you just see that there's about 10,000. I think in this case it was 14,000 neurons. Um, this is an example of the population code. Here you see uh, 110 or so stimuli, and here you see 300 of these 10,000 neurons. Uh, this is actually repeated stimuli. This is the average response. So the pseudo color map shows how much this cell responds to this stimuli. And you see exactly what you'd expect from a population code. There are some uh, stimuli that, that give uh, responses in some populations of cells, others that give responses in others. The code is generally fairly sparse. Um, there are some cells that respond to a lot of stimuli. There's some stimuli that drive a lot of cells, and there's some that, that don't get much response in either direction. Um, so uh, what we'd like to do, uh, oh, oh, and one thing I should say, I think I cut the slide, uh, is that if you want to play the game of reconstructing the stimulus, guessing which of the, the 3,000 stimuli it was that was presented uh, from the neural activity, you can do it with about 75% accuracy compared to one in 3,000 chance level, and you do that in one trial learning by a simple nearest neighbor uh, 
um, algorithm. So the information is there in the population code. The question is, what's the format that it's in? Um, so uh, what we'd like to do is, is answer this question of dimensionality. Uh, so, and we'll do that with pretty much the simplest way you can think, which is principal component analysis. Um, we're looking at the planar dimension here. We're going to ask, what is the planar dimension? What's the dimension of the cube this lives in? And what principal component analysis does is by measuring variances, it measures the dimensions of the sides of the cube. So the sides of these cubes, this would be variance one of the principal component, variance two, variance three, etc. If these now go to zero, and with cross-validation they really would go to zero um, after a certain point, that means that the neural code is in a flat subspace, but if they don't ever go to zero, that means it's in a high dimensional subspace. Uh, and we, we use a cross-validated method to do this that I'm not going to tell you about for the interest of time, but I'd be happy to answer a question. Um, okay, so that was the question. Uh, the result was so weird that it made us change the question. It was one of those results that you're really not expecting to see, and it makes you realize that the question you were asking was actually the wrong question. And the answer is that the variance follows a power law. We weren't expecting to see this. Uh, some people love to see power laws everywhere. We're pretty indifferent to power laws. Um, it's not that we went looking for the power. We were interested in the power laws, but uh, to paraphrase um, Trotsky, you may not be interested in power laws, but sometimes power laws are interested in you. Um, this, was, <laughs> this was one of those uh, cases. Um, so uh, this is the variance as a function of, of the dimension number uh, for, for, for seven individual experiments. And you see that in each case, on this log-log plot, the variance is a power law function of the dimension uh, with an exponent frighteningly close to one, just above one. There's some experimental error, there's some variability, but it's just above one in, in all cases. Question of clarification. Yeah, is that, so if you sum the part that's not uh, on the line, how much does that come to? Come to 50% at that point? Or this, this bit, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, th well, this is actually only about two or three dimensions. And, yeah, but the, the other thing about this, there's a reason we think th that these, these are being misestimated because of spontaneous activity contaminating. This is now getting beyond a question of clarification. Um, okay, all right. Uh, so we have this power law. What on earth does it mean? Why might we have it? Well, uh, first, what does it mean? So it means the variance goes like one, a half, a third. This is a mathematical object called a Hilbert cube for those who are interested. So the, 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 um, uh, the, the code is high dimensional, but that now seems like a fairly boring question to have answered. The real question is, why on earth does it have this power law? Um, so the first question is, maybe it's just because we didn't record enough, enough neurons. Uh, but actually, if we increase the fraction of neurons we analyze, uh, it's going here from red to blue, we find that the power law as measured by this correlation coefficient gets more accurate, uh, and the exponent gets closer and closer to one. So this is what I mean about we're reaching an asymptote, right? We're going up from a small fraction of the neurons to the full 10,000, and we see the power law gets more and more accurate um, as you add more and more neurons. So we infer that if we were to record even more neurons, uh, 100,000, it would continue to get more accurate. There's an inference uh, from the data. Same with the stimuli. If we take subsets of stimuli, uh, we increase the size of the subset, the power law gets more and more accurate, correlation coefficient closer to one, uh, and the exponent converges towards one. So it seems like this is something that's going to hold in a limit as you have as many neurons and as many stimuli as you want. So uh, another thing that uh, I've cut in the interest of time, you might think this is because of... Um, because of the statistics of the images themselves. Images themselves have a 1 over f power law, but that's not what causes this, because if we filter the images, uh, whiten them to get rid of the power law uh, in the data, and show these to the same mice, we see the same thing. We see a 1 over n uh, power, power law for the, for the dimensions of neural activity, even though it's gone from the stimuli themselves. So it wasn't that explanation. So what on earth might it be? Um, all sorts of 
things we, we investigated to see why it might be an artifact, none of them made sense. So what might it be? Well, remember something at the beginning that this idea that the code had to lie on a manifold was an assumption and that there are alternatives. So what might it be if it's not a manifold? Well, one thing it might be is a fractal. So um, fractals are objects that show increasingly more detailed structure at finer scales. And a good example of this is coastlines. So uh, in this uh, very uh, famous paper, now from the 60s, um, they uh, measured uh, the length of the coastline of Britain. And the west coast of Scotland, in particular, has this property that the smaller the ruler you use to measure it, the longer it appears to be. So as you go to finer and finer details, you see more and more detail at smaller and smaller scales. And this is measured by a quantity called the fractal dimension, which measures how the length you measure uh, with your ruler scales with the length of your ruler. So this is the fourth me measure of dimensionality uh, we, 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 we're going to talk about here today. So the point is that the relationship to what we've been talking about uh, is that if the uh, neural code was to lie on a, a technically a, a differentiable manifold, that means a smooth manifold, um, then it has to have a fractal dimension equal to its intrinsic dimension. Uh, on the other hand, if it was rough, if it was one of these fractal objects, the fractal dimension can be more than the intrinsic dimension. If, as you go to finer and finer details, finer and finer scales, you see more and more and more details, then the fractal dimension can be more than the intrinsic dimension. That's not the sort of neural code you would want because it, it would be susceptible to noise. And I'll give you an example later. Um, but the reason this is connected is that we were able to prove a theorem. And I've written the theorem in grey because I don't want you to read it unless you actually are a pure mathematician, uh, and in, in which case all of these fine details will be, will be appropriate. But for everyone else, just look at the, the approximate translation. The translation is this. A differentiable manifold of intrinsic dimension D, that means not a fractal, has to have variances decaying at least as fast as a power law with exponent 1 plus 2 over D. This is the possible connection to the power law result we saw. We saw a power law of exponent 1 to a very high dimensional set of these natural image stimuli for which D is, is basically very, very large because there's so many different uh, stimuli. It's a very high dimensional space. So this exponent of 1 is pretty much the limit you'd expect for a very high dimensional stimulus space. The um, eigenvalues, the, the variances could decay faster. This theorem doesn't say that they cannot decay faster, but they can't decay slower unless the manifold they live on is actually a fractal, and that would be a bad sort of neural code. So we can make an experimental prediction. If this idea is right, that this is why we see the power law of exponent 1, then if we were to present stimuli of lower dimensionality, um, then the variances should decay faster. Because if D, for example, uh, was 8, then 2 over D is 0.25. And the variances would need to decay at least as fast as a power law of exponent 1.25, um, etc. So uh, as, a, as a mathematician turned neuroscientist, I always get a kick of, out of having the word theorem and experimental prediction on the same slide, which you never thought uh, would happen, but, but, but this time it has. So to test it, what we did is take the image stimuli and filter them by projecting them onto a set of basis functions. In this case, eight basis functions means that now this high dimensional stimulus set has become a low dimensional stimulus set that just looks like these sort of blobs uh, and it's an eight dimensional stimulus set. And if we do that, we again see a power law, but this time the exponent is larger. Remember that the critical value of the exponent was 1.25. In this case, 
we have 1.5. So it's more than the value of 1 we said saw with a full stimulus ensemble, and it's safely above the critical value beneath which it would have to be a, a neural code, which is a fractal. Uh, for four-dimensional stimuli, the critical value is 1.5, and we're on the safe side of that again. Uh, and in fact, when we take various different types of uh, stimuli, uh, we're always on the safe side of this line, which is the 1 plus 2 over D uh, exponent. Um, so to summarize, uh, the uh, visual cortical uh, code, it has a high planar dimension, basically a full planar dimension. The unexpected thing was that the variances of its dimensions follow a power law, and the exponent appears to be a bit more than 1 plus 2 over D, where D is the dimension of the stimulus ensemble. So the intrinsic dimension of the manifold cannot be any more than the, uh, than the stimulus dimension. It could actually be less, but it can't be any more. So, uh, assume, but assuming it is the same, then the, the exponent is just above 1 plus 2 over D, uh, where D is the dimension of, of the stimulus uh, set. If um, the dimensions decayed any slower than this in the limit, uh, then the representation would have to lie on a fractal, uh, which means that the nearby stimuli could have very different responses. And let me give an illustration of this. So this is an illustration of some synthetic data we created in response to a 1D stimulus that lies on a circle. So you can imagine the orientation of a grating, some one-dimensional variable on a circle. And we've simulated four cases with different variance spectra. This first case is a low-dimensional code where you've got two eigenvalues. And we, we take a 10,000-dimensional uh, uh, representation with these eigenvalues and then make random projections into 2D. And what you can see through these different random projections um, is that this one always looks like a circle or an ellipse. It's low-dimensional. That means it can't do any interesting processing on the data. There's nothing really coming out of it that didn't go in. On the other hand, if you had a high-dimensional representation, in this case, we've got 100 eigenvalues that are all equal, uh, and then it goes down to zero. You get something that looks like a ball of string that you boot through into your backpack. It's actually smooth. It's not a fractal, because these all go to zero. So in the limit, they decay faster than the power law. But the problem with this is it doesn't respect dimensions. If you have two stimuli that differ by one degree, on this circle, their representations are as different as stimuli that are completely opposite. So this is a, a high dimensional code, it's close to the orthogonal code that supposedly was optimal, but it doesn't have good, it won't have good generalization properties. If we take a power law now, but with an exponent uh, below the critical value, we get a fractal, and it looks like a kind of fuzzy sort of mess. It's better than this one in terms of preserving distances, but it's still not really very good because a lot of the variance is devoted to these very fine details that probably it wouldn't be behaviorally relevant. Uh, on the other hand, if we're at the critical value, which in this case is 3 because uh, D equals 1, uh, now we get this borderline fractal. It's able to make complicated shapes. In other words, it's able to do more sophisticated information processing, but it still respects the distance in a way this one uh, does not. Um, and, and, and the reason this might actually be important for, for uh, information processing is, is illustrated by something that happens in deep networks. So um, deep networks, most of the time, have this, this problem of adversarial attack, uh, which means if you've trained a deep network, uh, and, and uh, now an adversary comes along and wants to fool you, they can, take, so they can take an image, corrupt it by a tiny amount of noise, and it produces a completely different answer. So in this case, this is a, a network that was trained to predict animal, classify animals. Uh, it gives this a 57% chance of being a panda. You add a tiny amount of noise and get out an image that looks to the naked eye exactly the same, uh, and this network gives it a 99% chance of being a gibbon. Um, so the point is 
this network is susceptible to noise, and that's exactly what a fractal would do, because it's not differentiable. It means that there is a direction, there is a type of noise, that you add a tiny amount of it, and it can give you an unlimitedly large um, a change in the representation, which would then fool the output layers in, into doing this. So it seems that the brain may have a, a neural code that is... is in very, it is not susceptible to this in the sense that it, it has this smooth uh, structure. Uh, okay, so to conclude, uh, uh, the uh, uh, covariances in the visual cortex have power law eigenvalues with exponents close to 1 plus 2 over D. This is close to a critical value um, where the uh, representation becomes fractal, uh, and this may be giving the brain the highest dimensionality representation it can have, the most orthogonal representations it can have, while still being smooth and therefore being able to generalize correctly. Uh, and that's it. So thank you uh, to the, the people who did it uh, and to the, to the funders and, of course, to you. Thank you. So we have time for questions. So people asking questions... Uh, can you make sure to use the, the mic on your desk and press, press the button? Um, so, one up there. Hi. Um, really interesting work. Uh, so, I was very interested with your last comment regarding the adversarial images. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there was an interesting paper uh, that came out um, from... Uh, some researchers where they actually showed that if you take adversarial images that can fool large numbers of uh, deep networks and then you show them to time-limited humans, it yeah. degrades humans' performance. Yeah. Now, um, but I also find compelling the idea that you're articulating that the brain might have smoother manifolds than some of these deep networks. But of course, there's potentially one way to test that, and I wonder if you guys are pursuing this at all, to, to imp some kind of smoothness, smoothness term in the cost functions in a deep neural network yeah. and see if you can protect against adversarial images and, and yeah. get closer to human behavior on yeah, them. Yeah, that, that, that's a great idea. And if we knew how to do it, we would, we would pursue that. If you know how to do it, I'd love to talk to you. I, I think I might, so we okay, can talk. we'll talk right yeah. afterwards then. Great. So actually, I have a couple of questions. Uh, so firstly, on the adversarial images, I mean, is camouflage not an adversarial uh, attack on a natural visual system? Um, yes, uh, but it, it, the point is that's a large change, yep. right? I mean, if, if I was instead camouflaged, that would be many, many pixels very different. This is only a few pixels, a tiny amount okay. different. Yeah. Um, the second question I had is, so in terms of... The dimensionality question, there are a number of different things like dimensionality, I mean, different formalisms that you can look at. Yeah. Um, there's, I mean, complexity, various types of entropies, uh, compressibility. Have you um, sort of compared with any of these other sort of formal approaches to see whether it, it sort of follows the same uh, approach as the sort of manifold type? Uh, no, uh, because, uh, well, our, our theorem really only, uh, well, okay, the, the, the question we were asking was about the planar dimension, and I think we answered that, it's high, it's as high as it can be. The question about the non-linear dimension, the intrinsic dimension, that's much harder to answer. In principle, you can do it with correlation dimension, and we tried, uh, the results were somewhat unreliable, so we didn't pursue it much further. I think it's just a much harder question to ask, so we haven't really tried yet. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. It's, it's much harder to do with finite amounts of data, basically, exactly. to estimate these exactly. things. Yeah. I've, I played a little bit, actually, with one of the, one of the other sort of large data sets with compressibility um, okay. notions, right. but, well, we should, uh, we should talk about but uh, yeah. I haven't got that far on it yet. All right. Um, so here you analyzed early visual cortex kind of cells, right? Yeah. In, in the mice. In one, yeah. Would you expect to have the same higher in hierarchy you go? Because it's yeah, great, different mechanisms. Great question. Um, great question. Uh, and I can only speculate because we haven't done it. But I would actually think that this 1 plus 2 over D bound 
won't be exceeded anywhere in the nervous system. That's, that's a guess, it's a speculation, but that's, that's what I would guess. The question, the, there's two questions. The first is whether, whether the bound is exceeded and you get a fractal. The second is whether it's fully used, right? It didn't need to be any sort of power law, and it could have been a power law that decayed faster. And when we make very simple models like Gabor linear filters, they don't have a power law, and if you try and fit a power law to them, then it decays much faster. So it seems like there's something in V1 that's using the maximum it can to go up to that limit. If you now were to say, if I've got a behavioral task, and my job is to classify these images into two types, uh, then in the muscles, you're not going to have that power law. You're going to have a binary yes or no. So maybe as you go further down towards motor production, the, the full power law is no longer used because it's thrown away some information. This seems, seems to me like a way of keeping the maximum amount of information, information you can while remaining smooth. Okay, um, really great talk, thank you very much. Over here, ah. over here, thanks. Yeah. Um, brief clarification, then a question. So the, the method that you mentioned, described at the start, so it's the, the covariance of the speaking patterns with the stimulus. That's what you're decomposing. Is that right? Uh, the, well, the covariance of the responses, yeah. Covariance of the responses, right. Um, so, and this may be, may be a naive question because I'm not super familiar with this type of uh, methodology, but because this is kind of an impulse response, yeah. can, would you expect some of this structure to also be present in the intrinsic activity? Ah. Right. You mean you mean without a stimulus? Yeah. That's a great question. That's a very good question. And we've done everything we can here to ignore the intrinsic activity and, and not include it. However, it accounts for a large fraction of the variance, um, maybe as much as half. This is why we need to do the cross-validation to make sure that we're looking at only the stimulus responses. If you just did PCA on the on the uh, raw data, then, then you would be including those spontaneous dimensions. The reason we think it has this little fall off at low dimensions is because some of the intrinsic dimensions are shared with the, the um, stimulus responses, but in a whole other stream of work I haven't talked about, it seems like there's really only one dimension of large overlap between the two. And that's why we think it's only a few dimensions that are underestimated there in the, in the power law. So anyway, fantastic question. A whole lot of technical answers, which I'll have to tell you about later. Thank you. Uh, that was a really good talk, Clara. Thank you. Um, so I'm curious, you, you mentioned at the beginning these principles, and two things that I was going to say. So. Um, uh, so I'll say one thing and then I'll ask a question that's related to it, right? So, so the, the way these papers work, it, it doesn't have to be in the same area, right? So some versions of this work have first you do... First, which work? This one? The, the Barlow for instance, right? So you could do total orthogonality in one layer and then do your second principle by learning in a next layer, right? And related... You see what I mean? That you want yeah. to have this smoothness. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be in the same group of neurons. Right, uh, so you, and I, that, I, I think I disagree because if you if you had one point which completely mm -hmm. orthogonalized everything, then one, you, yeah, it, one layer mm -hmm. that's obligatory, everything a bottleneck that completely orthogonalizes everything. That means it orthogonalizes the representation of this and this corrupted by one pixel, and you can do whatever mm -hmm. you want after that. You're never going to recover smoothness. Yeah, so this brings me to the second question. So it seems like what you're describing in some ways is that you want to have a more hierarchical code in the sense that, of course, there is structure in these images, right? The, the fact that you chose sort of two trees and just changing one pixel, which doesn't change. Do you have a sense, and uh, uh, you know, I can't do this off the top of my head, but it seems like when you do have things like a hierarchy of images, then they would generate differences in variance in a way that happens across yeah. finer and finer dimensions. Yeah. So I think there's some overlap. I just can't frame it in my head well enough. But you probably thought about it already, so I thought yeah, just to no, ask. I, th I think you're exactly right. I mean, uh, th so that's the idea, right? Um, the, we, we talk about this, this manifold, and, uh, and the point is it's not. What, what's the metric on that manifold? It's not the metric in pixel space. It's the metric in what I would call behavior space. 
space. So when two images have the same behavioral consequence, they ought to be similar in that, in that space. And more of the variance will go to, dis, uh, to representing large differences in that space than the fine distances in that space. And it's, so have you guys tried to play with that? I know people like in the monkey literature try to play with that yeah. a little bit, but have you not, guys done anything not yet. yet? Not yet. Not yet, but That'll we be have really the data. The data is also online. You can find a reference to it in that paper. So, so I would encourage anyone who wants to. And with that note, I think uh, we'd better move on to the next talk. So thank Okay. Thanks a lot.